Hi, and welcome to DC Public Safety. I'm your host, Nancy Weir. Today's program is on successful reentry. There are approximately 700,000 people leaving prison throughout the country every year, and it's vital for public safety to make sure they successfully reintegrate into society. Today's show looks at the experience of four individuals who have successfully experienced reentry in Washington, D.C., to get their point of view as to what it takes to succeed after prison. My guests for the first half are Eddie Ellis, activist, and Lashonia Etheridge Bay of the Mayor's Office on Returning Citizens. Welcome to both of you to DC Public Safety. Thank you for having me. We're going to start off today with a few questions, and I want you to talk a little bit about your experiences and your expectations. And I'll start off with Eddie. Tell me a little bit about what you expected once you left prison in terms of what life had to offer and what you wanted to get out of life. Well, personally, I didn't have any expectations because I'd never been to prison, but I knew that I wanted to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to just come home and make sure that I was doing the right stuff and putting myself in the right situation, and that's what I did. Excellent. And you had quite an experience in prison, as I recall, because you were in lockdown for quite a bit of that time that you were away. Is that correct? Yes. Out of my 15 years, I was in solitary confinement for 11 years. Mm -hmm. So solitary confinement meant that when you came out, there were certain challenges that you had to deal with when you got out. Is that correct? Yes. It was a lot of experiences and challenges I had to uh, deal with. Mm -hmm. And I addressed them with uh, therapy and other things. That's good. That's good. Because I think that's an area that a lot of times people neglect to look at for folks who are returning, that they have to deal with mental health issues, uh, the trauma that they've experienced. So I want you to talk a little bit more about that later as we move through the show. Lashonia, what about you? What did you expect when you got out? I actually had very high expectations for myself. Mm -hmm. I had expectations that I would succeed, do something really great with my life, just because I felt like um, I didn't go through that experience just for the sake of going through it. Mm -hmm. And I had expectations on being able to make a difference in the lives of other women who were experiencing some of the things that I experienced before I became incarcerated mm -hmm. and who were also incarcerated and would be at some point released. So both of you have really overcome a lot of the challenges that many men and women have to overcome when they leave prison. And I want to hear a little bit about some of the steps that you took to overcome those challenges. And Eddie, I'll start with you. Uh, what I did was uh, I had to convince myself that, you know, no matter how good or bad I do, it's going to be good and bad times in my life. Mm -hmm. And I was turned down for a lot of jobs uh, when I first came home, and I had to uh, just go within myself and find the strength to keep moving forward to mm -hmm. go get work mm -hmm. and that's what I did you know I try not to depend on everybody but rely on myself more mm -hmm. and I was more successful doing that that's great what about you Lashonia some of the challenges that I faced were around family reunification mm -hmm. because I have two young adult children mm -hmm. and two grandchildren and um, I think I expected our relationship to flourish when I came mm -hmm. home and that yeah. everything would all of a sudden be all good. But I found that the trauma that we experienced and the separation with me being gone their entire lives made it really challenging for us to rebuild so it hasn't been as successful as I would have liked for it to be. I've been blessed and fortunate to have um, developed a really strong support system. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my support didn't necessarily come from biological family members but the community mm -hmm. and mentors and people who just decided to support me I have never had an issue with obtaining employment even though it wasn't easy I always met the right people mm -hmm. at the right time who believed in me and were willing to give me a chance I've been home for almost three years and I've had four jobs that's great um, and right now I'm employed with the district government through the mayor's office on returning citizen affairs so I consider myself very fortunate I know that's not everybody's situation mm -hmm. but like I said I just had mentors and supporters who got behind me and wrapped their arms around me and just pointed me in the right direction and I've been successful well that's a good point because I know that often when you're trying to deal with uh, reintegration that you have to figure out what people what what support systems you can rely on Eddie did you 
find that you had certain support systems that were helpful to you? Yeah, first and foremost, my family. My family was always there for me. Mm -hmm. And when I came home, uh, I had places to go. I mean, I had opportunities to do different things, but I felt what was important to me that I found out what I need to do mm -hmm. after 15 years yeah, that's a lot. to make sure that I'm doing the right things, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what I did. I mean, I leaned on people when I had to, but I really had to find out what it was that I needed to do to mm -hmm. be successful, mm -hmm. you know, and it wasn't just as easy to just go and work and go back to school like mm -hmm. I wanted to because mm -hmm. of uh, certain situations, you know, in jail made me uncomfortable being in a certain environment. Mm -hmm. So I had to really get used to understanding what I needed to do mm -hmm. to make sure that I was on track and lean on my support group. And when I did lean on them, they were always there for me. So it's been it's been a blessing. Excellent. Now, um, Lashonia, you've been really instrumental in developing programming for women um, out of the mayor's office on returning citizens. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you've done? Yes, I was fortunate to be able to become one of the founding members of The Wire, which is Women Involved in Reentry Efforts. And The Wire is a group of women who have successfully reintegrated into the community mm -hmm. after incarceration. Some of them have served from two years to 25 years, mm -hmm. and some of them have been in and out of prison for a 30 year span of time and they eventually were able to recover and become successful and obtain degrees and obtain uh, full-term employment, lo living wage jobs, mm -hmm. and they're rebuilding their families and they're contributing to the community. So we decided to come together to not only support each other, but support women who are currently incarcerated and women who will be returning from incarceration. And for me, it was critical because for a long time, those women were my sisters, they mm -hmm. were my aunties. Mm -hmm. And um, when I came home, I felt like a stranger to my own family, mm -hmm. but I, I needed to continue to have them in my life. And so um, constantly women are coming home uh, one sister just came home, did 25 years, another just did 15 years, and we're able to embrace them and go over to the halfway house and visit them and share our experiences with them and share resources with them. So Support systems are just always so critical. critical. For women. One of the things that you've done, uh, Eddie, is you, you're an activist, but you also have written some books. Can you talk a little bit about those and also your nonprofit? Uh, when I came home in 2006, uh, I saw a lot of friends that I knew that said that it wasn't anything out here for them. Mm -hmm. uh, certain organizations, uh, lawyer organizations and other organizations had materials uh, with information in it, but mm -hmm. it wasn't getting in the hands of the people that needed it. Mm -hmm. So I created my own resource books for uh, inmates that's coming home in the D.C. and Maryland area. And at the time, I uh, created my own res I mean, created my own nonprofit, One by One, which I wanted to show men and women that we can can change, we can do better. Mm -hmm. And with that, I go inside of colleges and talk to people about working with people that's come on from prison, giving them chances, mm -hmm. you know, and things like that. And uh, it's been a blessing for me. It really has. That's excellent. And you've also been able to uh, educate others who may not have had those experiences. Is that correct? Yes, I've been in trainings with uh, probation officers, with lawyers, with social workers. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a blessing because, like I tell people, certain things books won't teach you. Mm -hmm. A person with the experience mm -hmm. can definitely teach you. And it's been it's been a humbling experience for me. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, I've learned that it's not us against them. It's just people right. who trying to make change. So yes. that's one of the best things for me. That's great. Uh, Lashonia, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the, your experiences under um, supervision when you came out and how that affected you, whether it was helpful or a hindrance? One of the things that I realized when I became incarcerated was that I um, experienced a lot of trauma in my community that led to some of my behavior mm -hmm. that landed me in prison. Mm -hmm. And then when I came home, I realized that I was dealing with another set of trauma because I was incarcerated for 18 years and literally grew up in prison. Mm -hmm. So being on supervision in some ways added to that trauma because I had some bad experiences at times. Um, you already know that um, I had an experience where my CSO would come to my job. And the CSO is? Co uh, my uh, probation officer, my parole officer, uh -huh. my community supervision officer. Mm -hmm. And she would come to my job in the bulletproof vest and the badge and 
I would be ashamed, mm -hmm. you know, the stigma. And it wasn't necessarily about what other people thought about me, but what I thought about who I used to be. Sure. As a result of seeing her present herself in that manner, because mm -hmm. I'm thinking, well, is she afraid of me? Like, mm -hmm. what, what would make her do that? Mm -hmm. And I'm not understanding that those are maybe some procedures something that she's taught to do. Maybe her reasons has had nothing to do with me, mm -hmm. but it, it did add to my trauma. But I've also had good experiences. Um, you've been mm -hmm. influential in my life. Um, Miss Quick, Cedric, you know, a lot of people have given me opportunities to grow and to speak on behalf of women. You know, Manon Butler, I, I've had some good experiences in terms of community supervision, supervision officers who understand and who are able to work with me and and kind of like maneuver my schedule to help meet me where I'm at in terms mm -hmm. of working and going to school and things of that nature. So there's always some good and some bad to every situation. So, you know, I'm, I'm just very, very candid and honest when I speak about how supervision can be a good thing and a bad thing because sometimes it, it can get in the way when you're trying to go to work, you're trying yes. to go to school, you're trying to do mm -hmm. all the right things, then you got to stop in the middle of your day and go see your CSO yeah. or take a urine. But, you know, it's consequences to everything that we do, and I'm responsible for my actions. So, you know, I just face it head on and keep it moving. Good, good. Now, Eddie, you talked a little bit about um, some of the challenges that you faced when you came out many years ago. Um, hopefully the system has changed a little bit to, for the better. But um, in terms of trying to get treatment, education, housing, employment, did you have any words of wisdom for those who might be watching today? Only thing I say, you know, mm -hmm. uh, every day, is not the same day. Just keep keep yourself motivated. Surround yourself with the right people. And network with the right people, and don't give up mm -hmm. because you know the chances that others may have, you may not have. Mm -hmm. You know, and we gotta be you know ever mindful of that. You know, just because my friend done it, I might not be able to do it. Right. You know, so you gotta have your own dreams and your own, your own aspirations, and be willing to stand on your own two feet. Mm -hmm. You know, and lean on your support group at the same time. So I just tell people to just you know go through you know the changes of what you need to go through make sure you're doing what you have to do before mm -hmm. you try to rely on anybody else because mm -hmm. a lot of times we fall back on others you know and ask them to do stuff that we're not willing to do mm -hmm. you know and most of the time we fail in that uh, in that way but just keep fighting yeah I think those are important lessons definitely um, so ingredients for success are pretty varied it sounds like it means that you really have to rely on a support group find your support group develop a support group be your own advocate. Are there other areas that you feel people need to be aware of in order to succeed? Because you all are great examples of success. I would say knowing your resources and being prepared to use your resources and not thinking that you're necessarily entitled to anything mm. because there's a lot of agencies within the District of Columbia and throughout the U.S. that have services and resources for people returning from incarceration, but they're not going to just hand you anything. You have to work for it. I've been home for almost three years and I just moved into my own place after being in transition mm. for like two and a half years mm -hmm. I was in a transitional house. I had to go through that process mm -hmm. before I was able to step out on my own and be able to have my lease and pay rent every mm -hmm. month. So you have to be willing to use your resources and go through the process and just take it one step at a time and not expect to recover and reintegrate overnight. Mm -hmm. Eddie, we just have a, a second left. Do you have any last words to share with our audience? Well, only thing I can say is try to continue to be positive and do what you know is best for you and surround yourself with the right people and you have a better chance of being successful than you surround yourself with negative people mm -hmm. and people don't have your best interest. That's absolutely important. I want to thank both Eddie and Lashonia for um, joining us today. Please stay with us as we continue our discussion on successful reentry. We'll be right back. Thank you so much. Thank you. At 13, you decided to be a rock star. At 16, you decided to be a quarterback. At 25, you married the girl of your dreams. So when did you decide to become a sex predator? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've achieved. Download sexual images of children or entice a minor online, and you have committed a serious federal crime. You will go to prison, and it will ruin your life. Exploiting a minor is a major offense.
Welcome back to DC Public Safety. I'm Nancy Ware. As stated during the first half of the show, successful reentry from prison is vital for public safety and strengthening our communities. To continue our discussion, we have two new guests, Petrina Williams, Chief Operating Officer for Clean and Sober Streets, and Lamont Carey, the CEO of LaCarey Enterprises. Okay, welcome to DC Public Safety. I'm so glad that both of you all could join us. I want to start off by asking you um, a question about what it was like when you were incarcerated in terms of connecting with your families. And I'll start off with Lamont. Did you have much engagement with your family while you were incarcerated? No. Uh, I think, like right after I got sentenced, and sent into the system, the prison system, uh, contact became like holidays or mm. when I was thought of, which wasn't very often. So no, I didn't have no real consistent contact with family. So that felt a little bit, like I would imagine, like you were abandoned there then. I think for me, that was the best thing that could have happened to me mm. because it made me angry. It made me, it made me angry in the sense that it, I, it made me look at myself to figure out what did I do wrong to make the people that's supposed to love me abandon me. And so it was the how I transformed, mm -hmm. how I transitioned, because I started to look at Lamont and work on Lamont. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I'm able to be the person that I am today because of that. That's a very positive approach. Right. What about you, Petrina? Well, actually, um, mine was a little different. Mm -hmm. um, I did have contact with my family. Um, I actually gave birth to my youngest son mm. during my incarceration. I was handcuffed to the bed and I was able to stay with him for three days mm. before actually um, returning and then you know, being shipped off to the feds. Mm -hmm. um, and my family would send me pictures, so mm -hmm. I was a part of his life vicariously through pictures. Mm -hmm. And um, I was blessed that they came to visit. They mm -hmm. drove nine hours and brought him when he was wow. six months old That's great. to show me that he was crawling. Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to, you know, have contact with my family and that kind of helped with that helped a little with, bit. You know, the transition. And I think you bring up a very important part, a point rather, that um, women often have different kinds of challenges for men when they're incarcerated and particularly if you're pregnant and you're incarcerated so there are a number of new approaches that we're trying to put in place now for women who have uh, who are pregnant or have babies while they're incarcerated and hopefully they'll be helpful in the transition because that's another form of trauma to Definitely. give birth while you're you know um, did you say you were uh, handcuffed, handcuffed to the bed, to the bed so that's not good. Emergency C-section. Oh my and, goodness. I mean, prior to giving birth, it was very humiliating mm -hmm. and traumatic being sentenced at 191 pounds, mm. handcuffed. Mm. You know, that's I was terrible. shackled. They just, I mean, my hands were shackled. They didn't, um, for safety reasons, shackle my ankles, but yeah. I was still shackled. Yeah, that had to be traumatic. Um, you talked a little bit, Lamont, about the um, the process that you went through in prison. Were there programs when you were incarcerated that you felt help, helped you as you were moving through this transition? To be honest, now that I look back, I see uh, some of the pro the things that I learned from the program appearing in my com my speaking engagements, mm -hmm. but at the time when I was incarcerated, I got in the program to get a certificate. So when I go up for parole, mm -hmm. and the one thing the programs did teach me that I got out of it that wasn't part of the instructions is that I learned how to program since my release from prison. Mm -hmm. So every project that I work on. I, I look at it as me doing a program in prison. So if, it's a, if I'm going, planning to write a book, I'm, I look at it, it's going to be three months for me to write the book, and it's going to be, the next phase is going to be two months, the next phase is going to be this amount of months. Mm -hmm. So that was the biggest thing that I learned from the programs, is how to program in the street. Now, did you go to college while you were incarcerated? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought, I remembered. So I'm going to just pick up your uh, bio a little bit and talk about all the accomplishments that you've made since you've been incarcerated and back into the community. You're now a writer, 
an actor, a poet, unspoken word. Uh, you you created your uh, your. Elt La, La Carey Entertainment to help fulfill dreams. You're internationally known. You're an award-winning artist and filmmaker, speaker and facilitator. I mean, I could just go on and on and you've written books. Right. Talk a little bit about how you made that leap once you got out. One of the things that I learned in prison from the college program uh, was business management. And in the business management class, when they started talking about like supply and demand mm -hmm. and distribution, mm -hmm. I knew that from my activity as a criminal. Mm -hmm. So in college, it taught me that I just had to change my product. Mm -hmm. And so when I came home, uh, I knew the arts in some capacity is what I wanted to do. But more importantly, my focus when I initially came home was to have a nonprofit to help individuals who I knew were and felt abandoned, who needed support systems, to needed to feel valued, mm -hmm. so to help them transition. But the nonprofit, I learned the nonprofit business was totally different from somebody that comes to a community that's not that well known. Mm -hmm. And so the arts became my lead. Mm -hmm. And so I eventually, I started acting, I started uh, uh, casting for like the HBO show The Wire through the Pat Moran company and then when the show ended I shot at my own series as well as a documentary mm -hmm. and then I was asked to adapt uh, my TV series pilot to stage to the Kennedy Center. So I've been very fortunate, but the most important thing, I learned how to change, to transition the skills that I learned from prison and from the streets into a positive way. So it helped me to recognize opportunities when opportunities presented themselves and I was overly confident. I wasn't, you know, most people say that we, we have low self-esteem and mm -hmm. we're not confident. I was never that. Mm -hmm. Before prison, during prison, or after prison. <laughs> so I was, so I approach everything with, I'm undeniable. And so that kind of helped me uh, succeed in a lot of things that I choose to succeed in. And I think that those are really important points because a lot of times, and we've talked about this together, uh, people who've been incarcerated don't use all of what they've learned, all the skills they had before, during, and after right. incarceration when they come out. Right. And so they underestimate what they have to offer the public when they come out. So I think that's very important. Katrina, can you talk a little bit about about your history, because now let me just give your bio here. Okay. Um, you've overcome quite a bit. I know addiction was one of the things that you had to deal with, but now you're not only the chief operating officer of uh, Clean and Sober uh, Streets, um, which is a long-term inpatient substance abuse treatment program, but you've been recognized by the executive office of the president, and they're coming back, I understand, to visit. You got your bachelor's in psychology. You uh, have done a certification at the University of Maryland in mental health, and you're now enrolled at Catholic University and pursuing your social work degree and licensing. Yes. That, those yes. are quite, quite accomplishments, quite wonderful accomplishments. Can you talk a little bit about your transition and the things that promoted you, that helped you to feel that you could move forward in that direction? Um, as Lamont was speaking about the structure, um, the structure while incarcerated prepared me for life structure because mm -hmm. what I found that prior to regaining structure I was leading a life of destruction mm -hmm. and um, so you know I, would, I took courses first as I worked as a teacher's aide and a tutor mm -hmm. during my incarceration so of course continuing to exercising others. my That's mind right. and yeah. encouraging others and motivating others mm -hmm. because one thing that I do know and continue to um, realize is that education is the new currency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Very simple. Mm -hmm. um, and upon coming home, I um, had supervision officers who were very motivating and encouraging. Um, Ms. Ishman, she had me to write down long-term and short-term term goals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she would always speak about um, statistics have shown that most goals that are actually put to paper are realized. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, uh, just having her as my personal cheerleader mm -hmm. um, and 
taking believing, in, believing in me and taking my goals and aspirations seriously as opposed to just looking at who and what I had done mm -hmm. but believing in me and what I'm saying that mm -hmm. I can be mm -hmm. um, that's that was very very instrumental in um, my process and that's important to to make sure that our public hears because so often as agencies we underestimate also the power and the impact that we have on folks that we're supervising and so just having a positive uh, supportive supervision officer is really critical to the to the reentry process as well so I'm really glad to hear that I also want to hear a little bit more about um, how how you looked at yourself as as men and women. I know that who you are as man, as a man and a woman today uh, is really an important piece of your identity and how you moved into the process of looking at yourself as a, a true man and a true woman of today. Can you talk a little bit about that? Lamont, I'll get you to start that. Well, for me, uh, when I, what I discovered in prison is that I had been living a, a lie. Everything about my life from the moment that I started participating in criminal activity was a lie. I had older, older criminals that were my mentors telling me that the world was this big and that the only way that I can get out of my community was that I had to sell drugs because education wouldn't provide it for me because I couldn't afford to go to college. And so I. I started living this criminal lifestyle, everything from the way I dressed to nicknames and to the way I, I carried myself, which eventually led me to prison mm -hmm. at the age of 16. And so now I'm, I have to adapt to a new lifestyle and become this new image. So once I decided that I had been living this lie, then I had to face this person I have never known, Lamar Curry, who was mm -hmm. my mother's son. So I had to learn like mm -hmm. what was my colors that I like, what did I like to do. So I had to de like develop a whole new person out of in out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And so now I want to make sure that every child, every ex offender, every person in the individual has the opportunity to know that they have the skills to become anything that they want to become. Because mm -hmm. I live it mm -hmm. every day. No mm -hmm. obstacle can stop me. Mm -hmm. So. Trina, you're going to wrap us up. You want to talk a little bit about your uh, odyssey in that regard? Well, um, for me, I had to move beyond seeking outside validation mm -hmm. in order to um, just become, I guess, more confident within mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, did you uh, seek professional help, and, and what was were there were there treatment providers who were helpful, or were they a hindrance? How did that work for you? Okay, um, well, actually, with the trauma, mm -hmm. because I was at disease with myself mm -hmm. before any other symptoms, mm -hmm. you know, manifested. Mm -hmm. And what I did was uh, I linked with the necessary resources mm -hmm. to address the trauma, mm -hmm. um, the substance use, mm -hmm. um, grief, mm -hmm. because. It was a lot of trauma surrounding my behavior, mm -hmm. unaddressed. Mm -hmm. And in order for me, what I realized was in order for me to continue to move forward, I had to address those issues. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized that I, you know, you can't conquer what you don't confront. That's good. And I, failure was not an option. I want to thank you both. And I want to thank all of our guests today for the wonderful lessons that you have to share with our audience. Thank and you. as you know, the audience is not just in Washington, D.C., it's all around the world. So people are struggling with all of the same things that you've struggled with, but that you've overcome. And the purpose today was really to make sure that there's hope, that folks understand that you can be successful, that you have to reach out to partners, to, to folks who can support you. And so I want to thank you both and I want to thank our other guests for participating. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching today's show on successful reentry and please watch for us next time when we explore another important topic in today's criminal justice system. Have a great day.